to the U.S. Farm Report, a program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, independent business, and the welfare of the nation by members of the National Farmers Organization. My name is J.N. Robinson. I'm an assistant promotional director to the National Farmers Organization. We have as our special guest on the program today our national secretary, Mr. Harvey Sickles of Fontenelle, Iowa. Mr. Sickles is not only national secretary, he's board member to the National Farmers Organization in the state of Iowa, and also legislative representative for the National Farmers Organization. Mr. Sickle lives near Fontenelle, Iowa, on a 440-acre farm. And along with the rest of his work and uh, legislative work that he has to do and his farm operations keeps him a pretty busy man. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity here today for you people in the city and uh, to tell you a little something about what we'll ta be talking about here today on this program. We'll be talking about the trends in rural America and how it affects uh, not only the farmers in the small towns, but everyone in America because of the food and fiber that is produced by this agricultural industry. And Mr. Sickles, I'm sure that with your travels and uh, your many duties and uh, your visits to Washington and around, uh, that this gives you a pretty wide spectrum of uh, not only the farming conditions, but along with what other people and how other people outside of agriculture see uh, this uh, farming industry and the problems of rural America. And uh, would you like to give us a little rundown now as to your duties in the national office and kind of what goes on down there? Well, yes. Joe, and thank you for that nice introduction. I always feel a little bit inadequate after being introduced by one of my fellow members of NFO because we are supposedly, and not supposedly, but are actually a militant, aggressive group, and this carries over into the things that we have to say. The bylaws of the organization state that the National Secretary is responsible for all the records of the organization. Now this would be an impossibility for any one individual. So as helpers and assistants and actually the people that really do the work we have employed in the national office, approximately 40 stenographers, clerical workers, file clerks and so on. We have an office manager and she has an assistant and we have about 12 officers and commodity heads and executive personnel that work in and out of the office. We have a printing and mailing room and all the things necessary to maintain the records and to disseminate the information that's pertinent to the problem at hand. Now, I don't believe that uh, you can explain too much about the office just by talking. We have the space that was formerly taken up by three grocery stores. This has been converted into or three stores, I should say, because one of them was a clothing store, and I think back in the history of the organization, mm -hmm. one part of it was in insurance agency. But these have all been taken over and converted into office space. Gives us quite a little room, but the thing is, we never have enough. We continue to grow, and we are maintaining our national office in the town of Corning. It's a small town, and this, of course, helps defray the expense of running the national office, giving us more money available to organize and promote the actual work of the organization, which is to establish a price for farmers' products. 
Joe, you have... Yeah, well, actually, Harvey, it looks like then... Uh, uh, one of the main things that's been going on in the past few years, as far as our National Farmers Organization is concerned, at, at Corning Highway has been uh, a continuous growth and expansion uh, within the office force and all over. Now, I'm sure that uh, you have other work that uh, folks would like to hear about here, and uh, maybe you could give us a rundown here on how it looks from uh, the people down in Washington and what they're thinking about uh, this rural problem today. Yes, I would like to add about this office space. This one store was added about two years ago, and we probably will have to expand again before very long. Now, the people of Corning, and I'd like to give a little credit to the town of Corning in this report. They have been very cooperative. They do all they possibly can to see that we have everything that we need. Of course, we appreciate it. And this is an opportunity for me to publicly acknowledge all of the things that they've done for us. Now, getting to the legislative work that I do in Washington, we are not a legislative organization. We are organized for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to establish a price for farm products for our members. Now, the last time I was in Washington, D.C., this little pamphlet had just been issued. It's April 1965. It's put out by the committee on agriculture for the House of Representatives, and it's compiled by their staff. And in the forward of this, written by Congressman Cooley, there are four items that he says that this material shows. Number one is there is an ever-widening spread between the price that farmers receive and what the consumer pays for food. Due to the efficiency of our farmers and notwithstanding the in cost, increased cost of processing and marketing, food is now is cheaper in relation to the wages received by Americans than in any prior period of our history or in any other country. The farmer is the least benefited of all our people by the wealth of abundance he has created. The attrition in the farm population and in the number of farms continues unabated. I'm not going to read the entire pamphlet to you. I just want to point out some of the information that's available in this little book. They have one paragraph to the consumer. And it says that due primarily to the exploding efficiency in agriculture and the decline in prices farmers receive, the overall cost of food to consumers in relation to their earnings continued to decline so that in 1964, food costs represented only 18 and 5 tenths percent of the average family's income after taxes. As recently as 1950, food costs represented 22 and 8 per tenths percent of consumer income. If the cost of farm programs were added to food bills, food still would take only about 19 and 5 tenths percent of the family income. The 18 and 5 tenths percent of their income Americans pay for food contrasts sharply with family food costs in other parts of the world. By the latest figures available from the United Nations, consumers in the United Kingdom spend 29 and 5 tenths percent of their income for food. In Russia, 53%. In France, 30.6%. And so on down the line with the remainder that they have listed, just about from 32 to 50%. The efficiency of our agriculture is reflected clearly in the fact that one farm worker in America produces enough food for 33 persons. While in Europe, the average farmer produces enough for 10 persons. 
And in Russia, under a collective system, one farm worker's production feeds only four or five persons. This is where the farms are big. American consumers are the greatest beneficiaries of farm programs and food abundance. Now, they have this to say about the farmers. Agriculture is the nation's largest and most vital industry. During the period of the nation's greatest prosperity, net farm income in the last 10 years, 1954 to 64 inclusive, was less by 23 million 610 23 billion 610 million. The net farm income of the previous 10 years, 1945 to 54 inclusive. The per capita income of people living on farms now is only a little more than half that of non farm people. Now, some information that I'd like to throw in here that isn't in this book at this point is that when they compile the income of farmers by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they add to the net income two and a half billion dollars for the value of the farm dwellings that you live in. In other words, if a farmer owns his own buildings and his own house, he is charged two and a half billion dollars for rent of the buildings that he owns. He is also charged $1 billion for the consumption or the home products that he consumes. This is added to the 12.6 or is included in the $12.6 billion. Now, the rural America, the farm population, has decreased by almost 50% in the last 20 years from 24,420,000 in 45 to 12,954,000 in 64. The number of farms has declined from 5,966,000 to only 3,383,000 farms today. Now, I wouldn't attempt to discuss all the farm programs that we've had or that we've been offered or to try to prove to you whether or not they have been effective or not been effective, but there is one little thing that I'd like to point out, and this is information that is not publicized to any great degree. For 11 consecutive years prior to 1953, the average prices paid to farmers were at or above 100% of parity with the rest of the economy. This was an era of great prosperity in agriculture. The government supported the prices of major storable crops for 20 years, 1933 to 52 inclusive, at an actual profit of $13 million to the government. That's right, profit of $13 million to the government. This profit was earned by selling commodities, wheat, corn, cotton, tobacco, rice, and peanuts taken over in price-supporting operations. So that's one of the things that can happen when the prices of farm commodities are at a reasonable level. Even the government made money on it. Now, Mr. Cooley, in closing his forward to this little book that I hope that you will all take the trouble to obtain, and it is available, is to develop the essential bargaining power with or without government stabilization machinery will require great unity and cooperation among farmers. In other words, you've got to work together to solve your problem. He recommends this document with its wide range of information on agriculture to all of those who are interested in the trends of food costs in farm income and generally in the expectations for agriculture in the years ahead. Now back in the inside of this little booklet, there is some figures that I think you might be interested in, at least I am. And this tells you how much the farmer gets out 
of the things that you as consumers buy. He gets 37 cents of each dollar spent for food overall. He gets two and a half cents for the corn in a 29 cent box of cornflakes. 54 cents of each dollar spent for choice beef. And two and a half cents for the wheat in a 21 cent loaf of white bread. About 22 cents from a half gallon of milk sold in stores for 48 cents. For clothing, about 28 cents for the cotton in a man's $4 business suit, shirt. Just to be sure you got that straight, I'll repeat it. About 28 cents for the cotton in a man's $4 business shirt. Well, these are some of the things that we're faced with. And as you talk to the congressman in Washington, D.C., and you talk to the other people that I meet, they are encouraging our efforts. They think that this is a very, very worthwhile program that we have, and many of them have told me personally that they can see a very good chance for us succeeding, and when it comes right down to it, why shouldn't we? Everybody else prices their products when they get ready to sell them. Now, farmers have, for some reason, that I as a farmer have never been able to realize, have always, <coughs> excuse me, have always sold their products for what they could get. And yet, after it's sold, everybody from there on to the consumer puts a price above his cost of handling and so on on the product, and he gets it. Joe, would you have any comments or Well, it seems that uh, what you've been saying here is that actually the trends in agriculture and, and rural America as a whole is one where farmers continue to get less uh, for their products that they produce. The consumer continues to pay more. The spread widens. And also the trend is uh, for Many, many farmers are leaving the farming industry because that there isn't a decent opportunity in farming any longer. And this affects rural towns. And uh, there's an all over picture here. With this kind of thing going on, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, would you have any comments on the, the, the bad effects or the effect that you think that uh, this is really having on America as a whole. Well, I, I wish that I was one of the people that can remember all the figures that we see, but I viewed one of the previous films that we have out on the circuit the other day, and Mr. Paulson of Minnesota quoted some figures in where the agricultural dollar multiplies seven times in the economy. And I don't know too much about the figures. I understand that these are generally accepted. But I do know what happens in my own town. And I know what happens in Corning and in Fontenelle, Iowa, where I live. I know that the stores that businessmen that go out of business that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, as long as I can remember, and some, for some reason, they close. Now, they tell us that this is because that due to the transportation that's available, the farmer can go a lot further, and so on, and therefore he buys all of his goods from the big cities like Des Moines, where we're making this film. And this I don't believe. I think that it's because we have actually poverty out in the country. And I think that I received an pamphlet from the Department of Agriculture the other day where they tell us that farmers now receive 76% of parity. This is up 1%. And as you start to read this little news item, they go on and they say that farm prices have risen 3%. But the things that he buys have risen 2%. So you come up with 1% gain. Well, this is an increase and it's fine. But 1% won't pay very many bills when you're already operating at cost production. 
Now, quoting a few figures, and these are from our seminar material that we used around over the country, and I don't attempt to remember figures uh, because I think anybody that does is pretty apt to make mistakes, so I read the figures. Now, they established, the government did, through some reasoning that any family with moneyed income of less than $3,000 is in the poverty class. Well, to me, it was quite a shock to find that 44 and 8 tenths percent of the farmers in the state of Iowa then qualify for the poverty class. I don't know that that's a very nice distinction, but nevertheless, that's what it says. Now, the national average is 47 and one tenth percent of all the farmers are in the poverty class. And this means that they have $3,000 moneyed income or less. Now, many people can't live on $3,000. How do farmers live on $3,000? Well, when you figure your income tax and you take your depreciation off, then you have a little more money to live on. In other words, they're living off of their tractors and their barns and all the things that they should be doing to improve. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about our organization. I think that NFO has an organization that can offer to the American farmers the opportunity to do something about his own problem. I joined NFO back in the beginning. I'm a charter member, which probably doesn't make any difference to you. But we have an opportunity to do something about the prices that we receive. We do have to join in order to do something about it. Now, we join many things in our lives. We join fraternal organizations for the fellowship involved. We join churches for the right to worship the way we want to. We've joined other organizations for a specific thing. And when you join NFO, you should do so just for one thing, because we have a very definite aim and a very definite objective. And as far as I'm personally concerned, I hope that we don't get any members in the organization that don't want to work towards the one end of establishing a price for their products. Now, as you join, you sign a three-year membership agreement. I've heard it said in the community where I live that you give up your freedom. Well. I've been a member all these years, and I'm still selling my products when I want to. Of course, during a holding action, I cooperate because I believe that this is necessary. And we have all of the people in the organization working for us as individuals for the sum of $25 a year. Yes, this is right. You're hiring all of the officers all of the some 300 people we have out in the field, all of the people that are working in the national office, and all it costs you as an individual is $25 a year. Now, do you think that we can solve this problem? Most of my neighbors that haven't joined say, well, yes, if you can just get everybody to join. But they won't do it. So, he says, I don't believe that I want to. Well, he's really the problem. He is the man that is the problem. Because if he joined, then all the rest joined, then the job will be done. So, I think that everybody that's interested in maintaining the family type farm and trying to solve the problem of agriculture and many of the problems of the nation along with it 
have a tremendous responsibility. And I don't believe that they should sit and wait for some one of their neighbors to make another trip over to them to ask them to join again. I think they have probably been asked many times, <coughs> and I think that they have a responsibility to go join and do something about the problem. Now, you've heard many things about the organization. Here's something that the Purdue University had to say about group bargaining power for farmers. In order to secure beneficial results at the bargaining table, the group must have some degree of power with which it can force concessions from the opposing side in order to secure a favorable solution to the negotiation. <coughs> and they're talking here primarily about the bargaining sessions. And I think this is important. You have to have power, and you have to display the power. And this is the reason for the holding action. Because you can go out and say, well, we have all of this production out here under membership agreement, but unless you display some power, you don't prove to them that you have it. <coughs> now, there's another little item published by the University of Minnesota that has to do with agricultural bargaining power. And it points out this fact. Apparently, if farmers are to achieve greater bargaining power, it must come about through group action since the individual farmer has little or no bargaining power. This is some of the things that we need to tell you. And I think that as you go along and study the problem, as you move into the things that have to be done in order to achieve the equality in the society that we live in, you have to take the initiative. You can't just sit back and let somebody else do it for you. Many of you say, well, I can't do those things. All I know how to do is farm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, all I know how to do is farm too. And the only reason that I'm up here today is because I want to raise the price of my products so that I can educate my children and so that the rest of the farmers in the country can do the same thing so that we can have equality of income. I don't believe in talking about fair share or the things that we should have a share of anything. I think we should have equality of income. And I believe that there's only one way to do this and this is to organize together and go out and demand a price for our products. It's been a real pleasure to visit with you in your homes this afternoon, and I certainly thank you very much. Well, thank you, Harvey, for <coughs> our report as it looks from your position as Secretary of the National Farmers Organization. And uh, certainly with the trends that now face and has been explained by our Secretary here today, uh, certainly every farmer in America should uh, rally to this and uh, become a member of the National Farmers Organization. This program has been brought to you in the interest of agriculture, small business, and the welfare of the nation by members of the National Farmers Organization and we encourage you to write or call the National Farmers Organization for more information on rural America. Thank you.